Hello and welcome to season four of a podcast about murder. We are so excited to be back again for some more episodes of Talking About Murder. And I'm here, me, <laughs> as usual, with Jem to talk about murder. Still us. I, Still here. I, the reason why I'm trailing off is because I've written brackets jibber jabber, hoping that we'd have some like natural <laughs> <laughs> sort of intro, but it didn't, it didn't pan out. Before we get into it today, little shout out to Tom and his girlfriend. Um, Tom sent us some really nice messages on Instagram and he was also saying they were looking forward to new episodes. Well, here we are. And we really appreciate all the comments that we get that are like super supportive and just really a pleasure to read. Yeah, we're always really happy to hear from people who listen to this show and like it. (laughs) So thanks a lot. I would say the negative comments, if you actually have something constructive to say, yeah that is also very helpful oh it's totally valuable like it's totally valuable and the way it basically i appreciate every comment even it's just you know if it's phrased like we're human beings i totally appreciate it (laughs) (laughs) it it does make a difference then it's um then it's not so nice but um but i'm pretty happy with the vast majority of things that come our way so Today, for our first episode of the season, we're going to be talking about Mary Bell, also known as the Tyneside Strangler, sometimes. Hmm. If you don't know the name Mary Bell, you're probably not from the UK, because I feel like this is one of those cases that most people in the UK are aware of, in some way. The thing is, I'd heard I know her name. Yeah, you know the name. It's The strangling is new to me. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> well, here we go. Mary Bell was, at the time, I think the youngest killer that had been sentenced in this country. She remains one of the youngest known killers. This is one of those cases where early on I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it, like when we started the podcast, because it is so known. It's an older case, and so like a lot of people know the basic story. But Mm. on the other hand, by now, a lot of the details had sort of slipped out of my brain over time so I felt ready to kind of revisit it during the research and I always find the cases where the perpetrator is a child are especially interesting to me as a phenomenon Mm. so there's that. I want to warn our listeners at this point before we start this story that this case involves crimes committed against children and that includes sexual violence against children so please be aware of that before we go forward. Our story begins in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, England, where Mary Flora Bell was born in 1957 on the 26th of May. I've also seen it down as the 24th of May, but in more places it said 26th, so that's what I'm going with. I admittedly looked up (laughs) where Newcastle is on a map because um, (laughs) as a thoughtless, self-absorbed Londoner concerned only with like what's in front of my face (laughs) on a (laughs) day-to-day basis, I don't actually know much about the geography of the rest of the country. And boy, was I wrong about where Newcastle is. Let me tell you that. Where is Newcastle? Do you know where it is? I I think I do, but maybe I don't. So I'm checking It's way more north than I thought it was. It's like so much further north than I thought. It's closer to Edinburgh than it is to London. And that's definitely not what I thought. <laughs> Hang on, I'm trying to find... Oh, okay, no, it is a lot further north than I thought. Yeah, I guess when they call it up north, they really mean that. <laughs> but uh, enough about how basic I am. Um, <laughs> Mary was born to a woman named Betty McCricket. And I say woman, but Betty was actually only 17 when Mary was born, which is basically a child in my opinion. It's not known who Mary's biological father is. So in the early days, Betty was alone in raising Mary. There is a guy who comes onto the scene, but I'll get to that. Betty wasn't having an easy time of it, shall we say. Unfortunately, she was taking that out on Mary. She neglected Mary's needs and generally was just not setting Mary Mm. up for a good life. I think that's the only way to say it. They lived in a home described as bare, often dirty and poorly kept in the Scotswood area of Newcastle. It's said that Scotswood at the time was an economically disadvantaged area with crime being fairly commonplace and a lot of people struggling to make ends meet. No, it's another one of these sort of depressing cases where in early childhood they just sort of are neglected or in a very unstable, depressing situation. Mm. One of the most disturbing aspects of Mary's early life is 
reported incidents of Betty attempting to kill Mary multiple times when she was just a toddler. And these attempts included giving the child medication like sleeping pills, choking her, and even accidentally throwing her out of a window. Oh my god. Yeah. (laughs) It's notable that when Mary fell out of the window, she did incur a head injury, which of course is one of those things that many people bring up when talking about Mm. those who go on to commit violent crimes. The injury was said to be to her prefrontal prefrontal cortex, which is the center of decision making in the brain. So make mm. of that, you know, what you will. We can read the physical abuse Mary suffered in two ways. We can suppose the simple option that Betty wanted to be rid of Mary, as there are also accounts of Betty simply trying to give Mary away <laughs> to people as well, Jesus which is really Christ. sad. But some people also believe this was a case of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, where Betty abused Mary in order to receive attention and other people's sympathy when mary would get into like what appeared to be accidents and get hurt betty would kind of get attention for that um so i guess we don't know that either way but that's what some people sort of suppose is a possibility but is she trying to make it look like an accident well many of these things were sort of written off as accidents like the falling out of the window and uh, oh, right. Getting her hands on pills and things like that. That could be read right, as okay. an accident. But unfortunately, physical abuse and attempted murder wasn't the only horrible thing that Mary had to endure as a child. So Betty, as a sex worker, would sometimes leave the home for long periods of time while she saw clients. She would sometimes travel as far as Glasgow to work, which is... That's quite Even far. though that's... Even though it's close to Scotland in Newcastle, it's still, like, a far way to go. Especially back in the day, I I have to imagine it would have taken longer than it does now. Probably. But um, she would also see clients in her home. And not only was Mary exposed to this, which was obviously highly inappropriate, Mm. to say the least, but she was being incorporated into it, according to her, according to Mary, from as young as four years old, which is horrendous yep um, I don't Betty, like that. no that's <laughs> awful Betty offered Mary out pimped her out essentially to her clients Jesus and it, it goes without explanation that this would have been extremely damaging and traumatic for Mary mm. I mean you can't <laughs> you can't even begin to explain how obviously terrible that is yeah. for a child you can start to see in this how in this story the victims of the eventual murders that Mary would commit are not the only victims. You know, Mary is a victim mm. too of this in this story. I will say that no one else has corroborated Mary's story here, but I personally don't see a reason to disbelieve her. I think it, I don't, you know, I don't know what you think, but I don't think that this is the like... The thing is, I do find it possible that you would make up weird shit that happened to you in your childhood but in this case i just don't feel like with she is all the other things that can be corroborated like the abuse um or these various accidents um yeah that would happen to her and things like that and the fact that i mean i just i see it you know it makes sense yeah no i totally believe this happened which yeah. is horrible one but... thing yeah one thing to note that is of interest and may come up later is that Betty was said to specialize in dominatrix type sex work and Mm. sadomasochism stuff like that and I'll probably come back to that when we talk about the crimes that Mary committed. Something that I haven't yet mentioned is that while Mary was still a baby Betty would marry a man named Billy Bell and there's like there's a lot of different information around about this relationship. I assume Billy Bell is where Mary got her last name from. Makes yeah, sense. Yeah, sounds plausible. And she assumed growing up that he was her father. Um, okay. But I'm not certain if there is a possibility that he actually could be. Like, I had Billy and Betty had a prior relationship, resulted in Mary. Maybe Betty gives Mary the name Bell, and then the two marry later out of a kind of attempt to have, like, a normal family situation. Right. Um, This is still the 50s after all. So, you know, people would be marrying after having a child out of wedlock to kind of... Mm. Or did they meet entirely after Mary's conception and birth and then Mary was given the name Belle later? Did she start life being called McCricket 
I don't know. So I wasn't able to be entirely sure what the story was surrounding that situation. But either way, Mary lived her childhood with Billy as the person she believed was her father. And who was sort of, emphasis on the sort of, playing that role. (laughs) Okay. Billy was a career criminal. He was generally unemployed and he he was a robber. He would be arrested for an armed robbery later and go to prison. So sadly, he wasn't a great parental figure for Mary either. Yeah. It's said that as Mary grew older, she became known around Scotswood for bad behaviour, such as stealing and vandalising and such like. She also had a reputation for being a bit violent towards other children. Uh, It was noted that she often lied and was disruptive at school. And really, I don't find any of that surprising, considering her home life. (laughs) (laughs) At this point, it's not like an inexplicable phenomenon. So we've established that Mary's young life was full of strife and real true suffering. She even had to go through, according to a couple of sources, the loss of a friend at five years old to a tragic road accident. Oh my God. And the worst part about this was she had actually witnessed her friend being run over by a bus, which is... Yeah, of course she did. It's <laughs> just to really shocking. like pile on the trauma. I mean, it is just like thing after thing with this girl. Like you feel, you can't help but feel bad. Mm. By 10 years old, Mary had a particular friend, Norma Joyce Bell, no relation, believe it or not, with whom she typically spent time. Um, Norma was a couple of years older than Mary. And Norma lived next door. They lived on White House Road. Um, So Bell's next door to each other. What a coincidence. I don't think it's a particularly common name. (laughs) But I don't think it's uncommon. No, but it's but it is also, a, it is a but it is surprising. It's like oh, two unrelated yeah. people called Bell who live next door to each other. It's a bit weird. On May eleventh, nineteen sixty eight, the Bell girls found themselves in trouble when a three year old boy they were playing with ended up severely injured by a fall. It's thought that Mary may have pushed the boy off of the roof of an air raid shelter, but with only Mary herself, Norma, and the very young boy there to know what happened, the boy's mm. parents believed it was an accident. And okay, it wasn't considered suspicious at the time. Who is letting their three-year-old out to play alone with, like, some much older children? This is the 60s, bro. Anything goes. I like, guess so. <laughs> you just be I like... Guess it's like, I know those kids. I've seen them somewhere. He'll be yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. This is in the t- days where you would just be, like, letting small children play on the, st- on the street kind of thing. Yeah, As I far guess. as I know. I mean, I wasn't there, but that's what I've heard. Yeah. The very next day, Mary would receive a stern talking to by police after three local mothers claimed she had assaulted and strangled their children. Oh my um, God. No charges were filed, but she was interviewed about the attacks. This might seem like a big thing to overlook, but um, from what I read, the vibe in Scotswood at the time was that it was like a bit of a rough area. <laughs> so yeah. Mary's minor crimes like thieving, vandalism being a poorly behaved student and even being violent were not uncommon elements of many other local children's lives. So it wasn't something that was attracting too much attention beyond like a talking to and maybe a slap and be on your way kind of thing. No, and I do think like the charges not being pressed isn't that weird because you would sort of just be like, okay, I'm going to try and show you that this is serious, but But this is kids kids being kids kind of thing. All of this uh, strange behaviour and all these incidents involving Mary would come to a head by the end of the same month. The day everything changed was Saturday, May 25th, 1968, the day before Mary's 11th birthday. On that day, the body of a four-year-old child, Martin Brown, was discovered in an upstairs room at 85 St. Margaret's Road, an abandoned derelict house in Scotswood. This was obviously an extremely disturbing find, such a young child. And it was all the more disturbing because the body was found by two boys who had wandered into the house to play. Can you imagine right. okay. <laughs> finding that as a child? I mean, that's mental. You would, that would scar you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but then I was going to ask how it was found. And then I assume that this house is like a known place where kids go yeah, and hang go out, and, I guess. go and hang out and play. I mean, it's an abandoned house. It's got natural curiosity for mm kids police arriving at the scene were not immediately clued into the idea that they were looking at a murder 
there was a little bit of blood on Martin's face, which may have come from his mouth, but there were no obvious signs of a violent death. There was a discarded bottle of pills, painkillers found near Martin's body at the scene. And because of this finding, the police assumed Martin had died accidentally after ingesting these pills. So that he'd wandered into this house somehow. I mean, he's only like four he's years like old. Four. I don't know. I mean, I do see how you kind of see what you want to see and you don't want to believe that someone's killed a child. Totally. But at the same time, it's like, do you seriously believe that this four year old wandered out of his house by himself, got to this other house, and then decided to sit down and secretly eat these pills? Yeah. I'm with I you. I mean, it I... is. It, it could it's, happen. It's possible. It's not yeah. that it's it's not that it's something that's impossible to have happened. It's just like there's a lot of steps you know, involved. Yeah. But yeah. A thing worth mentioning is that the day after Martin's body was found, Norma Bell's father caught Mary strangling Norma while the two were home were spending time together. And he was not pleased, obviously, and he slapped Mary and he told her to leave and go home. Mm. A couple of days after the discovery of Martin Brown's body, police were called to a local nursery school which had apparently been broken into and vandalised. Investigators found four notes riddled with poor spelling at the scene of the break-in. One note referenced the death of Martin Brown, saying, We did murder Martin Brown. Fuck off, you bastard. Apologies (laughs) for that language. (laughs) Which Martin is misspelled, so is off. (laughs) Oh, right, okay. And another red fuck off spelled as F U C H O F. Fuck. That's of. like in one word? No, like fuck of. <laughs> That's so funny to do it. Like, because the H sound is such a like Germanic way of spelling it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't even think of a word in English that you would commonly know. Well, I'm, I was trying to imagine their accents as northerners and how that might have played into how they thought the words so. were spelled. Uh, another red fuck off, we, we murder, watch out, Fanny and Faggot. And I think that's supposed to be read as if Fanny and Faggot is the sign off, like two fake names. Oh, right. So it's like, fuck off, we murder, watch out, Fanny and Faggot. But it's not addressed to Fanny and Faggot. No. <laughs> <laughs> Police at first believed the nursery break-in and the notes were nothing more than a tasteless prank. The nursery had actually been broken into on other occasions, so after this one they installed an alarm system, but they didn't necessarily think it was actually connected to the murder, they just thought it connected to the death. They just thought it was um, yeah, just some someone... kids being kids again. Yeah. Four more days passed. Martin's distraught mother answered a knock at the door to find Mary Bell, who asked to see Martin. Martin's mother, confused, reminded Mary that Martin had died. To which Mary replied brightly, Oh, I know he's dead. I want to see him in his coffin. Martin's right. mother, horrified, slammed the door in Mary's face. This is one of those like famous things about this case, that she goes to Martin's house and says she wants to see him. Mm. Very creepy, obviously. And callous, you know, she knows... Wait, so I don't very... need to tell you that she knows what's happened to him. Yeah. So. Well, I guess you could almost believe that she's either in a state where she's not completely aware of what she's doing, but, and she could almost be like unsure, but this seems very clearly like a sort of taunt. Yeah. So is Martin like a local boy? Like they all know each other from before. They all live in this same area, yeah. right. like Scottswood. So they would all know the sort of local children. So as I said, I don't need to tell you at this point that Mary and Norma were both the nursery vandals and involved in Martin's murder. That's a given. Mm. It is thought that Mary strangled Martin herself alone after luring him into the abandoned house and that Norma was later brought to the scene by Mary. Okay. So one could surmise that perhaps Mary's attack on Norma the following day was an attempt to keep her silenced and going along with keeping the murder a secret but Mary's other behavior kind of contradicts that like uh, she shows a sort of lack of fear of being caught maybe it's just a child's naivety about how much she could get away with before someone got suspicious but like going to Martin's house 
her and Norma breaking into the nursery and leaving notes. Mm. They would later be caught loitering around the nursery again because the alarm system (laughs) that they'd installed went off and the police arrived and Mary and Norma were there. Right. So this is like brave. It's hard to tell how much at this point how impulsive she is or how in in control she is. I I feel like she's very much like led by what's like her instant thoughts. She just does stuff and it doesn't link up. But it's like the combination of intentionally leading someone to a place where you know you're not going to be found and the body isn't going to be found right away, but then just strangling them. It's like not thought out enough to have like a but then leaving the pills as well, I get I assume that was staged. I'm her. not certain if they if she knew that this is obviously a smart girl, but I'm not sure whether that was a lucky coincidence for her or whether mm. she had placed that there. I wasn't able to find any confirmation of whether it was already there or whether she had brought it. Okay. But Mary even begins to tell her classmates that she has killed Martin Brown straight up, like after this time. So she seems to be very erratic in her behavior, Mm. which I suppose is what you expect from a child perpetrator. Because this is, at the end of the day, a child (laughs) who isn't going to think through their actions maybe so much. Mary's claims of having killed Martin were not taken seriously because she had a reputation for making up stories, lying, showing off, and yeah. being callous and actually just being weird. Yeah. So it wasn't like people like people just didn't believe her basically. Well, also I think it's telling that she behaves differently with different people. Mm. So this is with other children where she may not she may be letting her guard down a bit because mm. who would believe other kids? Yeah, it's a good point. Unfortunately, it took another child's life before people would take notice of Mary. Two months after Martin Brown's death on July 31st, Mary, this time accompanied by Norma throughout, lured three-year-old Brian Howe to an empty lot, an area that sort of served as like a dumping ground. It was just kind of like an empty, blank place where people Mm -hmm. dumped stuff. With Norma in tow, Mary killed Brian by strangling in the same way as she had done to Martin. But this time she took it a step further. This is quite graphic, so just a warning. (laughs) She used a pair of scissors to mutilate Brian's body, including scratching an M, presumably for Mary, into his stomach area, making cuts to his legs, cutting off pieces of the boy's hair, and even mutilating his genital area. So this is just awful. I mean, it's really this stuff that makes people go, how could a child even start to imagine doing things this dark to another child? One so small and defenseless as well compared to her. It defies explanation really for many people. But but we mentioned earlier that Mary's mother, Betty, was a dominatrix or had performed acts of sexual domination on her clients at times. So some people have wondered whether Mary had witnessed Mm. acts that might have inspired her actions in the murders of Martin and Brian. Things like choking or strangling someone are certainly known features of some sexual domination activities. Um, But that and also maybe even cutting someone, like that can be a part. That's all stuff that people theorize she could have seen or could have even been done to her as part of the abuse that she suffered herself. Mm. But certainly something that she'd maybe seen her mom do to men and that kind of informed... Yeah, that's definitely possible. An immediate search began for Brian Howe after he went missing. Mary and Norma offered to help Brian's sister find him. They helped her search the neighbourhood. Mary, in her trademark sort of way, actually suggested searching around the area where she knew that she knew that Brian was Mm. in the dump area concealed by some concrete blocks she claimed that she thought Brian might have been playing there but interestingly Norma stepped in to discourage this and said oh he won't be he won't be there and delayed the discovery so this is an I guess an example of Mary being like lol let's see what happens and Norma being like no (laughs) stop (laughs) Jesus Christ yeah but so how involved 
do we know like do we know how involved Norma was in the murder or was she just there? I don't think anyone will ever know exactly how these things played out. Mm. It's definitely assumed that Mary is the killer and Norma mm. is the accomplice who is just kind of there. Yeah. But it's not known exactly how how involved she was. The only people that know that I suppose are Mary and Norma. Mm. Eventually, police discovered Brian's body, and this time there was no question about whether or not this was a murder because of the mutilation. They launched an investigation which involved interviewing a reported 1,200 children from the surrounding area in the hopes that one had seen what had happened to Brian. Mary and Norma were both interviewed, and they gave answers that police found suspicious. Both girls seemed Mm. overly interested in the investigation, acted strangely, and... While Mary appeared cool and evasive during questioning, Norma seemed sort of excited, like bizarrely sort of Mm. just not right, basically. (laughs) The girls had also changed their stories upon being re-interviewed about their their actions that day. Police also received another lead. Mary had been seen in the company of Brian on the day of his death. It's quite an interesting approach to methodically like interview all the children of the area just in the hopes that one of them was hanging out with brian or saw something yeah i think i think they knew what the area was like that a lot of kids would be playing unsupervised Mm. with each other so it would be like quite you know it would be the the thing to ask the kids um what they were doing no it makes sense but it's quite a i don't know wasn't expecting it meanwhile an autopsy had some shocking findings for the police The letter M scratched into his body was an obvious link to Mary, but even further, the pathologist had determined that there was a lack of force used in the attack on Brian that suggested that his killer might have been another child, which would have seemed like a crazy suggestion, but it made sense to the pathologist when they were looking at this. They were like, okay, so the mutilations are also more like scratches than they are deep cuts. Mm. Um, The strangulation marks is just not matching up with what an adult, what it would look like. Well, that's what I was going to say for the first murder where they're not sure it is a murder. It can't be obvious that he's been strangled. And the reason for that is because it was enough force to kill him, but it wasn't enough to leave the bruising that you would Mm. think of seeing if an adult had strangled a child to death yeah finally on the day of brian's funeral mary would be seen loitering around near his family's home it was reported that when his coffin passed she began laughing Mm. (laughs) and even i just i'm sniggering but it's not really funny but it's just bizarre gleefully rubbing her hands together Like a sort of cartoon (laughs) villain or something. Just like a sim. (laughs) Exactly like a sim. (laughs) Police called Mary in for another interview. This time, Mary decided to make up a story to avert suspicion. She claimed that she had seen Brian being hit by another boy on the day he died. And that the boy who hit him was carrying scissors. Police jumped on this detail of Mary's story immediately. The mutilation of Brian's body with scissors was a detail that had not been released to the press intentionally. So only the killer Mm. would know that scissors were used in Brian's murder. So when Mary brought up scissors to try and incriminate a fake suspect, police knew she'd made a mistake Mm. there and she had to be the killer. Because it's also not the most obvious thing. No. It's not like, oh, it was a knife and they said it was a knife. And it's very much the kind of thing that a child would do to be like and he was carrying scissors you know like to try and paint this picture but she doesn't realize that she's made a mistake there during interviews mary and norma began to blame each other for the crime saying they were each of them said they were only the witness so mary blamed norma norma blamed mary as such both girls were charged and they were charged with both the murder of brian howe and the murder of martin brown who by now had been connected Two. Mm. Police now understood that Martin hadn't died by accident. The body had seemed without the hallmarks of a violent death, but as you said, when they viewed that alongside Brian's, they were now sure that Martin had also died by strangulation at a child's hands, um, the hands of Mary Bell. Mm. Did they still have his... Were they still able to verify this? 
with his body. I think or that they did do a second autopsy in that. I think so. Not a hundred percent sure, but I think they would have had to to have enough evidence to charge both. That's true. So I believe that they did. At the trial, Mary came across as confident and a dominating personality. It was very easy for the jury to regard her as the mastermind of the duo. And Norma as the witless, easily led friend who had been swept up in it all without understanding what she was getting into. But it's interesting because Norma, you said she was a bit older than her. Yes. And at this age, a couple years is like a lot. Yes. It's it's quite a big difference. I don't know if there was a suggestion that that perhaps Norma was behind her age mm, cognitively. I guess that's possible. But... Mm. That was definitely the vibe that the jury was getting and that many of Mm. the adults involved in the case were getting this vibe. The trial was presided over by Justice Ralph Cusack, a high court judge. As the trial opened, the court heard the prosecution's claim that Mary and Norma killed Martin and Brian, quote, solely for the pleasure and excitement of murder. The defense, meanwhile, establishes their angle that the children could not be held fully responsible for what they had done and that Mary Bell in particular displayed signs of mental illness. Both valid points. Yep. I have to say. <laughs> it, they're not actually mutually exclusive. You know, like they're, mm. it's, both things can be true. Evidence was given over nine days and the court heard all the evidence overwhelmingly showing that Mary and Norma were responsible for the crimes. This included Mary's behaviour towards the victim's families, including asking to see Martin's body and handwriting mm. experts' testimony linking the girls to the confession notes found at the nursery. Forensic evidence included grey fibres from one of Mary's dresses, which was found on both victims, and maroon-coloured fibres from one of Norma's skirts, which was found on Brian. So there was no doubt that the two girls were guilty of the murders. However, Mm. the defence was able to successfully counter with evidence of diminished responsibility. I think... I think I've said this before, but I'm unsure if diminished responsibility is a term used outside of the UK. But it's basically the term for any mitigating circumstances that might change the normal sentence for a crime. So it's almost okay. it's almost the equivalent of the US legal phrase like not guilty by reason of insanity. Right. But I think they also use I think they also use mitigating circumstances as a phrase in the US to describe this type of thing. Mm-hmm. But just clarifying that. Just to say that there's something in this case that means that... Things will be different this time. It's a bit different. The defence called psychologists to the stand to give their testimony after examining the girls. The court heard from Dr Robert Orton, who claimed that Mary had the classic signs of a psychopathic personality disorder. The disorder, he said, would lead to her lack of empathy towards others and also to impulsive behaviour, as we were talking Mm. about. Dr. David Westbury, a home office psychiatrist, testified to the same, that Mary had a psychopathic disorder. He admitted that he didn't know what should be done with Mary and where she should be incarcerated or housed, but said that she would need lasting treatment over some years. It was, as I said, easy for the jury to perceive that Mary had killed both boys and was also Mm. suffering from some disorder of a kind. That on top of her age would mean she should be found to have diminished responsibility. Her intelligence right. and poise when giving her testimony was in stark contrast to Norma, who seemed childlike and overwhelmed. Norma came across to the jury more like they'd expect from a child, while there mm-hmm. was something about Mary that was not quite right to them. They could see that she was not a regular child. Yeah. After four hours of deliberation, the jury of seven men and five women finally decided to convict Mary. The conviction was not for murder, but for the lesser charge of manslaughter due to the diminished responsibility. Norma was acquitted of the crimes, with the jury apparently satisfied that she had been under Mary's influence and was not a danger on her own to others. Doesn't seem like it. No, I think that was the main feeling was that even if Norma was that even if Norma had been more involved, it was like she would never have done this without Mary, if you see what I mean, or she would never have been involved in something like this, like on her own. Yeah. And and it's more about thinking like, what's the danger going forward? For Norma, there is, it feels like there isn't, but for Mary, it's different. It kind of reminds me, although it's very different, of the Pepin sisters and how one of them is very clearly like 
the dominant force in the duo. Oh, yeah. Mary and Norma, then aged 11 and 13, appeared at Newcastle upon Tyne Assizes. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's that was the name of the court. Oh, right. For sentencing on the 17th of December, 1968. Justice Cusack said of Mary, This girl is dangerous and therefore steps must be taken to protect other people. But he noted the tragedy and the lack of precedent for dealing with minors who had committed such crimes. He remarked, It is a most unhappy thing that in all the resources of this country, it appears there is no hospital available which is suitable for this girl. It is an appalling thing that with a child as young as this one, one has to take into consideration such matters. I am Mm. not entirely unsympathetic, but anxious as I am to do everything for her benefit, my primary duty is to protect other people. That's well said. He sounds like a reasoned guy. Yeah. He clarified that the sentence he had handed down to Mary would be open to review as time progressed. That sentence was life detention at Her Majesty's pleasure, which is a bizarre (laughs) legal term here in the UK, um, which essentially means a person can be held indefinitely and that their suitability for release will be periodically assessed Mm. throughout that time. As for Norma, the judge said that he hoped she would be left alone, that no one would, quote, attempt to discuss the matter with her. He hoped that she and the people around her would be able to put the crimes behind them and that Norma could live a normal life. After Mary's conviction, she naturally received a lot of attention from the media who clamoured for stories about the sensational child killer, which was which was then, then quite, you know, an explosive thing that had never really happened before in this way. Mm. They portrayed her as inhuman, referring to her as being born evil. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's quite a typical thing of the press, though, to just be like it's this very, child, yeah. born evil. It's very British press. Like, that is what yeah. they're like. You can imagine, you know, the sun is just like evil incarnate. Mm. Yeah, we're very like that. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, her mother, sold many stories about Mary, um, sadly. Many what of bitch. them were fabricated and fueled the media's morbid interest so betty would sell them things like writings that she claimed that mary had done and things like that not sure if they were really yeah mary's but like it was just kind of like betty was just like ka-ching let's just see how like, this it's plays so out. such a weird like i just genuinely can't understand that as a reaction no but I mean, there's not much I can understand it's about this. It's totally woman, to be in line with the rest of her behavior as well. She's just like, yeah. Where can I? I don't How can know, I? Where can I benefit? Like, yeah, yeah. Mary spent eight years in juvenile detention centers, receiving treatment and appealing to be paroled, but facing numerous denials. She was transferred upon her adulthood to Moor Court Prison in Stoke-on-Trent. It seems like it might be closed now, but Moor Court Prison was an open prison, meaning it was essentially a minimum security prison. And in the UK, open prisons are a sort of stage of rehabilitation where the aim is to slowly get someone used to less and less control and more and more freedom until they are due to be released. Or it might house prisoners who never had very serious convictions. And so right, okay. if they were to escape, it would be extremely low risk to the public. They wouldn't be like right. they're not violent offenders kind of thing. Prisoners in open prisons are trusted to leave the prison for certain reasons. Oh, okay. They can even sometimes get jobs outside of the prison and then come back just to live so they just basically oh, okay. they just live at the prison and then they that's get a, a lot job. more freedom than i was <laughs> imagining well it's more of a rehabilitation than a punishment yeah. so it's like for people where it's like you're almost going to be released with trying i to, mean it makes sense like it's i'm not I against think it's it a, as a concept a lot of people are against it as a concept for reasons like they feel that people should be being punished and stuff like that Or they're worried about people escaping. And people do escape from open prisons all the time. But it's like, do you really want to overcrowd maximum security prisons with people who don't need to be there? Well, it's also like one day or another, these people are going to be released. And they need to be equipped to totally deal with that. 
and that's why we have problems where we have people who don't know how to function outside of prison no, and they automatically turn back to a life of crime because they're not accepted or not able to find any sort of like yes exactly um way of surviving without it totally i and and i think i think stuff like this is is beneficial in september 1977 though <laughs> mary escaped <laughs> from more court with another woman police rushed to calm the public saying that mary was no longer considered a danger to others Inspector John Reynolds of Staffordshire Police said, There is no organised search. The Home Office is quite happy that Mary Bell is not dangerous. Well, <laughs> hang on. I mean, there's a difference between being like, it's all right, she's not a danger, and just being like, we well, aren't even may looking. as well just leave her. <laughs> we you aren't know? Even, we're not even looking for her. Like, it's fine. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think they were just trying to really express how little they were worried, but... But there's a middle ground. Many people were upset with this um, because Mary was a convicted killer. She wasn't just like someone who'd nicked yeah. some sweets from a store or something. But Mary was... Yeah, so a lot of people were upset with this. And the fact, the very fact that Mary was housed in an open prison and not, quote, behind bars, as one conservative MP put it. But has she, throughout like the time that she was in prison, did she display any kind of violent behavior well they were saying that over the time that she'd been in prison she'd been receptive to treatment she wasn't being violent she was i mean she wouldn't have been moved to an open prison had she That's not true. been been being regular <laughs> in her mm -hmm. sort of activity any in any case mary and her fellow escapee were at large for two days before being located and returned to prison so you know what what can you do that's what it is yeah it was 1980 three years later when mary bell was finally released from prison after serving 12 years she was 23 years old because she was a child offender she was given a new identity not much was known about her after that for a while other than that she would have a daughter of her own four years after her release hmm. 18 years later in 1998 she was tracked down by journalists, which does show the level of ongoing interest in the case so long after mm. the fact. It was only once her identity and location were compromised by the media that Mary's daughter found out who her mother really was, which is a pretty mad thing to imagine finding yeah. out. When you're the daughter, the daughter would be like 14, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, so like, right, can you okay. imagine at 14 years old finding out that your mum is Mary Bell? That, that be, is mad. That would be pretty mental. <laughs> Sadly, and I do mean that particularly for Mary's daughter, who has done nothing wrong and deserves to live in peace. Mm. The two had to leave their home. It said that they had to hold sheets over their heads as they left to avoid being photographed mm. by the reporters that were gathering around. I definitely think that's highly wrong behaviour by the well, press. I mean... With regard to Mary herself, but especially with this, as you were saying, this girl who is a completely innocent bystander. Totally. Regardless of what you think about Mary, her daughter is just a person who has done absolutely nothing She's wrong. also a child whose privacy is being violated. Totally. I don't think it's fair to punish, like, I don't think it's fair to punish Mary with this kind of invasion of privacy as a child offender. So I really don't think it's mm. fair to do that to Mary's daughter, anything like that, for sure. Interestingly, Mary's daughter was originally only entitled to have her identity protected until she turned 18. But in 2003, this was challenged. Mary Bell and her daughter won the right in high court to have their anonymity extended for life. And I think that's fair. I think that's only fair for both of them. But yeah. definitely for the daughter who has done absolutely nothing. Like, you know, there's no justification. Well, this is something that could just destroy her life yeah, and, for no and reason. Yeah, and it would be absolutely no reason because she's never done anything wrong in her life. So that we know of. <laughs> so it's like... No, but there's also no justification for it. Whereas I could understand to a certain extent that you would be like, Mary Bell is a killer and we need to know yeah. where she is. Yeah, but I mean, I'm satisfied that... But even then, I'm not. I'm 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 pretty. I'm satisfied that authorities know where Mary Bell is. I'm sure that yeah. they know where she is and who she is. 
Well, that's the thing. It's like, what are you going to do with this information? Why, like, do I need to I know where like, she is? What I am I going like to do? I feel like I don't need to know. I know a lot of people don't trust, like, authorities to keep track of everyone, and that's fair. But I feel like it's not like nobody knows where she is and she's just roaming around killing people. Yeah. She's almost definitely not reoffended because I'm sure authorities know where she is. But mm. anyway... It was reported in 2009 that Mary Bell had become a grandmother. Her current whereabouts are unknown, but she is 63 years old. And as far as anyone knows, she is living a normal life under her protective identity, as is her daughter. So there are obviously myriad opinions on all of that, on what Mary deserves, if she deserves anything. Now that she is a free woman trying to seemingly move on from her past... Mm. whether she's profited in any way, how the media should treat her, and all of that. June Richardson, the mother of Martin Brown, is one of the people who does not believe Mary deserves the protection that she's received, stating, it's all about her and how she has to be protected. As victims, we are not given the same rights as killers. I understand the point that she's making that her, I mean, obviously she's a victim of a horrendous crime and that will forever be associated with her because there's no way she can or would even want to change her identity. But the point that you made at the beginning of this episode is that Mary is also a victim. She's not just a killer. Mm. And that has led to her actions. And I think, yeah, she's a child. This is what we, when we were discussing the um, James Bolger mm. case, it's just so difficult to hold children accountable to the same degree as like adults. Yeah. I mean, I understand how these parents feel and I totally empathise with these feelings. But at the same time, just imagining what Mary went through as a child, that alone would warrant some kind of sympathy, I think. I agree with you. And I think we have to just think about, like, this is how we're behaving as a society. This isn't This isn't like an eye for an eye type of deal. This is like, how is society going to behave towards a child who's committed a crime we're not gonna as a society like treat them in the same way as we would treat an ad i feel like i don't know we can't surely that doesn't feel right you know like you can't bang mm. up a 10 year old in like a fucking you know maximum security prison yeah. for the rest of her life like and then tell everyone where she is and who she is that's we like that surely that doesn't feel right but i do i do definitely understand how you could feel that way like i'm not saying it's without reason yeah and and like you said i i totally empathize with what june's saying that she can never have peace you know she can never be like mm. i don't know i i empathize with that but it's hard there are many books on mary's case and many tv adaptations of the story i've seen this case on tv on British crime programs numerous times. The one I remember most is from the series Murders That Shocked the Nation with Fred, uh -huh. Fred Dynanidge, I think his name is, where he talks about British crimes. I'm sure we watched some of that series together, you and me. We had, we watched some of it in Copenhagen. <laughs> I was just going to say that that's where I thought we watched it. It's a bit of like true crime junk food, some might say. Like it's, mm. it's kind of dramatised kind of thing. Yeah. But it's quite well done. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's fun to watch. It's a bit like Unsolved Mysteries, something like that. Yeah. I haven't read any books on Mary's case, unfortunately, but I will mention one that is well regarded and that I would like to read. And that is Cries Unheard, The Case of Mary Bell by Gitta... I'm sorry if I'm saying this wrong. Gitta Sereni or Jita Sereni, it could be, but sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but she covered the trial and I think mm. it may also be published under the, under the title The Case of Mary Bell, A Portrait of a Child Who Murdered. The thing I find interesting about this book is that Sereni wrote from a position of trying to understand and even have compassion for Mary as a troubled child mm. and not to be so quick to demonize her. She also writes about Mary as an adult trying to move on from her past. So that's it for the case of Mary Bell, our first case of the season. Um, thank you very much for joining us for a fourth round of this nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Last season, I have to say, it was so exciting and heartening to see um, so many people tuning in every week. I mean, like so many by our standards, but like truly 
every person beyond me and you who listens to this is like an incredible feat for us like truly incomprehensible we've gotten a lot of extra attention mainly from the john benet episode from a year and a half ago or something yeah that hit some kind of stride and we've had a lot of comments discussion it's been amazing but also a little intimidating one thing i do want to say before we finish in regards to that is particularly with many of the older episodes i can say i never considered that any episode would get enough views to have people commenting and having strong opinions in our direction and Mm. so I am mindful that some of the older episodes I might have done differently now or I might have said things differently than I would if I did them now after more experience I'm still I'm still very proud of all of the stuff we put out I'm to say that like I'm just proud of it knowing that we were and still are in many ways amateur podcasters doing things for fun so I'm proud of everything that we've put out but we aren't psychologists we aren't criminologists we aren't detectives we aren't experts with PhDs we aren't professional writers we aren't hosts or researchers (laughs) or producers or basically anything (laughs) no but that's the other thing I was going to point out is that we are people who have other responsibilities in our lives and it is a genuine pleasure to research and record this podcast and put it out in the world but we don't have the time necessarily to dedicate to fully researching every episode especially since we're doing it by ourselves we don't have a research team backing us up we can't always verify what we read nor do we have the time to yeah so you know it's just something to bear in mind i mean like you know if i get if i we were to get something wrong you know sorry but <laughs> that's that's how it is what we are is two lowly rubes discussing things that we find interesting <laughs> basically we're just talking about things that we think are interesting and entertaining in some way i don't think that means we have no value <laughs> no but it's definitely worth bearing that in mind when listening to our show so on that note have a great weekend. Yeah. Don't have a good one. Get into any trouble. And we're also on social media. It's a podcast about murder on Instagram, podcast about murder with no e on Facebook and about murder on Twitter. And you can also send us an email at a podcast about murder at outlook.com. See you next week for another episode of a podcast about murder. Hell. <laughs> okay.